I'd now like to introduce the second speaker. This is Margaret Firi Casaro. And after Margaret is done with her presentation, we'll be able to have a live chat. Margaret is going to talk to us about the ECHO trial and tell us what's next on contraception and HIV, policy, practice, and research. Welcome, Margaret. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers of this virtual interest 2020 conference and we do appreciate the opportunity to present the ECHO trial, what's next on contraception and HIV with regards to policy, practice and research. This is the outline of the discussion today, one summary of the trial, two implications of the study and then finally what is next. Let us start with why ECHO was conducted. Over the last three decades, there has been concern over hormonal contraceptive use and the risk to HIV acquisition. The map that I am showing here is highlighting this concern. There are also mixed outcomes on association of increased HIV risk and hormonal contraceptive, contraceptives from observational studies. It was therefore important to carry out a well-designed clinical trial to answer this particular question. So data from ECHO, which stands for Evidence for Contraceptive Options and HIV Outcomes, was to guide uh, what kind of counsel and information women will be given when they seek contraceptives, so that usage of hormonal contraception is both safe and effective. So safe and effective contraceptives is very essential to the health of women and their families. It is important because it helps to empower women and it boils over to the community in that it uh, stimulates economic and social development. ECHO was a multi-center, open-label, randomized clinical trial and was comparing HIV incidence and contraceptive benefits in women who are using one of the three methods below. The first one is intramuscular delivered depomedroxyprogesterone acetate, DMPAIM, and a copper intrauterine device, IUD, and levonorgestrel implant. The primary objectives was to compare that HIV incidence among women randomized to those three contraceptive methods I've just highlighted. The secondary outcomes included pregnancy, contraceptive method discontinuation, or contraceptive method continuation, and safety. And this trial was closed in October 2018, and it ran from December 2015. On this slide, we show the design of the ECHO study. So 7,829 women were enrolled in the study. They were aged between 16 and 35 years old. They desired contraception, but were also willing to be randomized. Our randomization ratio was one to one to one, so that each of the arms of the study had just over 2,600 women. And we followed these women up for 18 months at three monthly visit intervals. On this slide, we are showing where ECHO was undertaken. Uh, ECHO was conducted in four countries, Kenya, Zambia, South Africa, and the Kingdom of Eswatini. And the trial had 12 sites. Nine of those sites were in South Africa. I am going to share the results for HIV and STIs uh, from the study. Uh, we had 397 out of the 7,829 women acquire HIV during the study. This translated to an overall rate of infections of 3.81% per year. Below there, I am showing the risk by contraceptive methods. And these, we found that none of these contraceptives substantially increased the chances of getting HIV compared to the other contraceptions. For STI results, we show in this table the prevalence of gonorrhea and chlamydia at the beginning and at the end of the study. 
And our conclusions from this was that the risk of gonorrhea and chlamydia was considerable in this population at both the screening and final visits. And this was even in the context of routine prevention counseling and syndromic management. In this table, we show prevalence of gonorrhea and chlamydia at the beginning and at the end of the study by age group. And in this table, it's showing that at screening and final visit, the prevalence of gonorrhea and chlamydia was significantly higher in women who were 24 years or below when those were compared to those who were 25 years or older. Again, this was despite routine prevention counseling and syndromic management. On this slide, I am going to summarize the implications of ECHO findings. Number one, uh, the contraceptives that were tested in ECHO did not increase the risk of HIV acquisition. Therefore, it's important that we increase access to broad range of contraceptive methods. Number two, the HIV acquisition in this population was very high despite HIV prevention services. And therefore, we need to be more aggressive with HIV prevention efforts for women. Number four, the push to integrate family planning and HIV has been going on for over a decade now, and silos are definitely not the way to go. We need to promote the connection between family planning and HIV. We also noted in the study that the prevalence of STIs was high in women who were seeking contraceptives and not STIs. And therefore, we need to focus on looking for new STI screening methods, new STI treatment options, and new prevention strategies as we move away from syndromic management. Number five, we need to focus and integrate the services of sexual reproductive health and put the woman at the center. What is next on contraception and HIV with regards to policy, practice and research? There is urgent need for action to invest in and expand HIV prevention, STI services and contraceptive choices in the broader context of providing sexual and reproductive health services. The national policies need to change to reflect this action. In changing of national policies, it will provide leadership, direction, and helps to increase funding, which will move towards implementation at the local level. There's need to have deliberate action that will ensure implementation of recommendations so that changes are reflected in the way we practice. The response with regards to research must be to provide evidence and support towards policy implementation and change or improvement in our practice. We'll begin with policy. National policies must migrate to reflect the investment and the expansion of HIV and STI prevention in the context of uh, contraceptive services and this they must do in consultation with stakeholders so that there's input uh, of the following issues. Contraception, we need to take stock of what contraceptive options are currently available and with that look at what options do women want based on the range of options that are available and the information that we provide for them in order to have informed consent. On HIV and SDI testing and treatment Again, we need to look at what is available for screening, for diagnosis, and for treatment. And look at that uh, in the light of women's values and preferences about the testing, including where you should be doing the testing, partner testing, HIV self-testing, and uh, uh, self-collection of samples, and as we move away from syndromic management of STIs. Another important consideration for input into policy change will be looking at the opportunities and barriers for women who access contraceptives, HIV and STI services. And we must look at what are the logistical concerns in being able to provide these services together. Are there any structural issues to consider? What about user fees? Will these impact on access? Looking at attitudes and beliefs of those who provide the service and stigma and discrimination are also important consideration, as well as concerns legally 
such as age of consent for adolescent girls. With regards to practice, the ECHO findings have shown us that it is no longer business as usual and we must relook at practices and implement recommendations towards HIV and SDI prevention within the spaces of contraception service. And we can do this by increasing access to condoms and HIV and SDI testing and treatment to women, which we may think that has been done over the years. But as we do that increase in access, we must consider strategies to expand and extend this increase to provision to men. Because if we do not do this, the effect that we want will be limited. We have known over the decades uh, about the benefits of integration of uh, sexual reproductive health and HIV. And uh, it is now time for us to use this knowledge of benefits of integration to implement changes in practice and do this at scale. We need to uh, implement the WHO recommendations on the integration of HIV self-testing, uh, voluntary assisted partner testing, STI self-collection of samples, as well as moving away from syndromic management of STIs. We need to implement adequate STI case management services in the contraceptive clinics uh, by diagnosing and treating women who are symptomatic as they come to seek contraceptives. We need to do targeted screening and treatment of those who are at higher risk, both those who come in symptomatic and those who are asymptomatic. We need, again, to provide PrEP or create linkages uh, for PrEP in uh, contraceptive clinics. WHO has recommended offering PrEP to anyone who is a substantial risk. And those who fall in that category are people who come from populations where the HIV incidence is greater than 3% per 100 person years, as well as those who come from key populations. We need to support healthcare workers in, who are providing contraceptive services, and uh, we are also asking them to provide HIV and STI services by making sure that they are well trained, they are well mentored and we implement strategies that help to reduce the burden on them. The other important consideration is to look at how we can uh, improve our community outreach and engagement in order to create demand for HIV services within family planning services. With regards to research, uh, research should respond to provide data and evidence that will aid changes in policy and practice. Implementation science is critical. Some examples of projects that could be undertaken are those that dually advance family planning and HIV prevention, and those that we look at woman-centered approaches as we provide sexual reproductive health. Other studies are those that can be targeted at producing evidence for policy change, such as what is current now with regards to contraception and HIV prevention versus values and preferences of women, demographic characterization of our contraceptive users, as well as determining the burden of disease uh, in terms of HIV and STIs. As we indicated, uh, the burden of STIs is high in our population, speaking to the need for more research with, the, with diagnostics. So we need new STI screening and diagnostic test studies. Uh, studies with biological mechanisms can highlight new targets that can be used for developing diagnostic tests and treatment options. Other studies uh, that we may consider are those that to investigate how to increase male reach and engagement in STI and HIV prevention, diagnosis and treatment, studies that can uh, investigate the reach and uptake of key populations of these integrated services, as well as looking at models of community and stakeholder engagement in sexual reproductive health and rights issues. Cost effectiveness studies and monitoring and evaluation programs are also critical. And that was my last slide. Allow me to acknowledge the women who participated in ECHO for their motivation and dedication and the communities that supported them. And then I'm saying thank you for the slides that I've used in this presentation to Dr. Jared Baton, Dr. Nina Phillips, and Dr. Linda Gio Baker. 
as well as to our funders. And these were my references. Thank you very much.